Hey folks, super excited to share this conversation with you today about becoming forever employable and ensuring that your career stays as agile as your work. Now, the story I'm going to share with you today is actually my story. It starts with um, the things that I went through as someone who worked in tech and someone who worked in agile and really considering the future of my career and then ultimately looking at how the ideas behind agile, agility, product thinking, design thinking, lean startup, lean UX, all of these ideas can actually be applied in a very similar fashion to the professional development that we have as practitioners, to our career growth, and, and to ensuring that we are building a reality where opportunities continue to find us. Now, look, the story that I'm going to tell you starts with me on my 35th birthday. My 35th birthday was January 31st, 2008. Now, on the morning of my 35th birthday, I woke up in a cold sweat. I woke up in a panic, and I couldn't figure out why. Why was I freaking out on the morning of my 35th birthday? Because up, up until that point, uh, things were pretty good. This is me. At 35, these are my kids. When I was 35, today they are teenage girls running around the city. Uh, very, very terrifying in many ways. But nevertheless, uh, up until that point, I'd had a pretty good run. Everything was pretty good up until the time I turned 35. Um, I started off as a broke musician. I played in bands for a long time. I played piano in bands. And when that got old, when, when not, that's not the music that got old. It was the being broke part that got old. You know, the internet came around and saved me from this. And, I, and, and back in 1999, uh, which is when I decided to kind of quit being quit, quit my attempt at becoming a musician, a full-time musician, and start really thinking about making some money. Um, if you could spell HTML, you could get a job. And uh, I could do a bit more than spell it. I could actually mark it up. I could do some graphic design. And so I got my first job in 1999 as a web designer, doing basic graphic design and basic HTML for basic standard brochure aware type of websites. And that was great because it paid real money and it started me down a particular career track. Shortly after joining IXL, which is the company that gave me my first job, uh, somebody let me read this book, uh, which was called uh, Information Architecture for the World Wide Web. Now this was the first edition of that book. So we're talking about you know, 20, 21 years ago. Today that book is in its fourth edition and it's a book that changed my life. It gave me a sense that there were other places that I could sit in the waterfall and be uh, even more influential and more successful as a web designer. Because back then doing graphic design and HTML, I was the last person in the waterfall. And, and in 1999, it was all waterfall software development, especially for the web. And information architecture moved me further upstream and gave me the opportunity to have a bit more influence on the products and services that we were actually building. So I decided I was gonna head down that path and that really set me down a particular career path of information architecture and then ultimately UX and interaction design. So I've got this direction and I started to head down, ah, crap, the dot-com bubble burst. <laughs> like All of that just kind of went away. And so for the next couple of years, I bounced around a lot, picking up design uh, jobs wherever I could make them uh, happen. And I worked at America Online for a while. I worked on the software that went on these CDs. If you ever received one of these CDs in the mail in the late 90s, kind of early 2000s, you're welcome. I had something to do with that. Um, I moved to the West Coast of the United States. I worked as the director of UX at a company called Web Trends. And about 10 years into my career, I land back in New York City as the director of user experience at the ladders. This is right about the time that I am now, I've turned 35. And so 10 years into my career, I've clawed my way up to middle management, right? And so I wake up on my 35th birthday, married, two kids, house, you know, a car, a couple of cars, uh, middle management job, decent salary, and I'm in this cold sweat. I'm in this panic. And it dawns on me why this is such a, uh, why I'm having this particular panic attack. And, and I realized that in five years, I'm going to be 40. Now, now look, from that side of 40, when you're 35, 40 feels old. From this side of 40, 40 feels fantastic. I'd love to be 40. It's, it's absolutely fantastic, right? But my realization is the, the morning I turn 35 is that in five years, I'm going to be 40. And that felt old to me. It felt like I was going to be old. 
I was going to be expensive and I was going to be unemployable. Why? Because I was seeing uh, and feeling like younger, better, faster designers were coming into the field and they were going to take my job from me. They were hungrier than me. Uh, they had better skills than me. And more importantly, and perhaps most importantly, they were cheaper than me. And I was terrified that in five years, I was not going to be able to provide for my family. And I had to figure out a way to make sure that when that time came, I would have work for the foreseeable future. And so on that morning of my 35th birthday, I made a resolution. The resolution was this, I was no longer going to look for jobs. For the entirety of my life and certainly of my career up until that point, I was told that you had to go chase the next position, that you had to go look for the next job, apply for it, put your resume out there, put your CV out there and chase it. I was no longer going to play that game because my belief was that I was going to increasingly start to lose that game. And instead, I was going to shift the dynamic 180 degrees and create a situation where jobs were going to look for me, right? So instead of, of if you think about it kind of from a, a systems perspective, instead of working in this push model where I push myself out into the market and into job opportunities, I was going to create a pull model, one where opportunities are continuously attracted towards me. And that way I've always got a steady stream of things that I could be doing should one thing or another not actually pan out. Now I know what you're saying uh, and you're thinking, you're just like, Jeff, that's absolutely mind blowing. I can't believe that. You're gonna change the dynamic. You're gonna shift things 180 degrees. But this brings up a lot of very big and very important questions about exactly how you're going to do this. And these are the questions that I immediately set out to solve after I made this resolution that made me feel a bit better on the morning of my 35th birthday. First question, does anyone know who I am? If jobs and opportunities are going to find me, if I'm gonna create this poll dynamic, does anyone know who I am, right? And in 2008, I would argue that very few people actually knew who I was. Why would they look for me, right? Why would people come to me and say, Jeff, we need your help? What is the problem that I help them solve? How would they know that about me? Um, how would they find me, right? 2008, we've got Google, we've got LinkedIn, right? What else, right? Where do I wanna live online so that the, the right people find me and that ultimately the right opportunities find me as well? What kind of work do I want to get? In other words, as these opportunities come in, I don't want just anything coming in. I want specific things that I want to do, that I'm good at, that, that keep me engaged and, and moving forward in my career. And I set out to solve these questions. And I would argue that the second question here is the most important one. It's the one that I would challenge you to really think about is why would jobs look for you or opportunities look for you? And if you kind of unpack that a little bit, the real question is what problem do you help people solve? If you strip away the job titles and the job descriptions, what are the problems that you help people solve? Like for me, for example, I help take complicated ideas and make them simple and then I teach them. Right? And so I've done that throughout my career, whether it's been through design or writing books or workshops or training. And I would challenge you to really think through why would jobs look for you? What problems do you help people solve? Now, to set, to finding the answers to these questions and to create this reality of a, a, a pull dynamic where opportunities are finding me, I had to create a platform. That's what I knew how to do. This is how I, I figured this had to happen. I had to create a platform and then use for myself, right, under my own personal brand, and then use that platform as a magnet to pull in these opportunities. And, and the components of that platform, as far as I could tell when I set out to do this, were three things. My expertise, so what, what do I know how to do? What do I have experience doing? Content, how do I share that expertise and that experience? And then audience, how do I build and grow an audience and a network that is eager to consume more of this content and more of my expertise over time, because those leads, those jobs, those opportunities are going to start to come from that audience, from that network. All these things together equal a platform, a platform of thought leadership, 
a platform of recognized expertise. You could call it a personal brand, whatever you want to call it, but that's the goal in all of this. And so I've spent the last 10 plus years, it's safe to say at this point, 12 years building that platform. And in the process of doing so, I discovered that there were at least five qualities that I, in myself that I needed to build this platform and become forever employable. And in addition to that, I took five specific steps to get there. And I'll share those five steps with you and be very specific about what that took. But when you add these things up and in, in retrospect and kind of looking back at this, what I've recognized is that the same tools and techniques and mindsets that we use to build agility into our organizations and agility into our products and services and our product development teams can be applied to our career and our professional development. And if we think about our career and our professional development as a product or as a service, something that can be continuously improved, something that we can learn from, something to sense and respond from all the time, then we start to create this forever employable reality. Okay, so let's get specific. What are those five qualities to becoming forever employable that I discovered in myself? Now, again, these are not the only qualities, but for me to get to where I am today, to having built this platform, I needed these five qualities. And, and they're these five qualities, entrepreneurialism, self-confidence, continuous learning, improvement, and reinvention. And these should sound familiar to you, right? These are the qualities of agile, or more specifically, these are the qualities of agility. But again, instead of focusing these qualities on products and services, we're focusing these qualities on ourselves, on our career, on our professional development and growth. Now, look, it's not obvious that all of these things exist in everybody, and they probably don't. I really had to, to dig deep to find these qualities in myself. For example, entrepreneurialism. I have never thought of myself as an entrepreneur, never. I was never the ideas guy. I was always the execution guy. And I had to really look into my life to find examples of where I had been entrepreneurial and then use those learnings and that experience to start to build this platform. I told you earlier that I was in a band. Well, it turns out bands are startups. And not only was I in bands, but I was usually the person who managed and ran the bands that I was in. And bands, like startups, it's you and your friends. You've got a crazy idea. It's going to change the world. It's going to be amazing. You just got to get everybody to buy into it. And you're trying to build and scale a sustainable business out of it, right? I had done this. I'd done this for years. I just didn't realize I was being entrepreneurial. But I had that hustle and I had that understanding of what needs to happen to build that uh, awareness around the thing that you're doing. And so I leaned into that experience to build my entrepreneurialism into my platform. Um, Self-confidence, really interesting. Self-confidence, a lot of folks say they don't have it, right? Look, being in bands and being on stage helps that a lot. But I, I looked for other experiences in my life where I threw myself into strange situations or unfamiliar situations and ended up succeeding. Now, for me, the truth is that when I was 22, I graduated from university and I joined the circus two days later. Literally, this is a photo from that circus. I lived in that truck on the left that says circus on the side there. I lived in that truck with seven other dudes uh, for six months. Now, look, there's a lot to say about that. We do not have enough time. But the short of it is, is that this was a pretty strange environment, a different world, a different culture. And I was an outsider thrown into it in the middle. And I had to thrive and I had to succeed. And initially, it was pretty miserable. And I was fairly unsuccessful. I'd made a ton of mistakes. But over the course of six months, I had learned how to build partnerships, how to build collaborations, how to build friendships, how to understand the rhythms of how a system worked and how to become successful and thrive within that system and then ultimately improve it as well, add my uniqueness to it as well. And that taught me self-confidence. And I used that to build my platform as well. 
Continuous learning is something that I've done throughout my career. I showed you earlier that this is one of the books that really transformed my life, really pushed me in a direction that I may not have gone down on its own. And this is how I learn continuously by reading, by speaking with others, by engaging in the community, by trying out uh, new ideas and seeing what happens to them. And it's the only way, right? Continuous learning is the only way that we progress our products. It's the only way we progress our services. And ultimately it's the only way we progress ourselves as agile practitioners. If you're stagnant, right? If you stop learning about your product or your business, that's gonna go out of business. If you stop learning about your profession, about your career, about your professional development and your options and your opportunities, well, you're gonna be out of business there as well too. So continuous learning, leaning into that lifelong practice. Now, the interesting thing is that the learnings that you pick up from that are going to provide you with opportunities to improve what you're doing. The challenge is you're gonna to have to want to improve and get better. There's a phrase that I love and I learned it watching a TED talk, which is likely the most cliche thing you can say these days. I learned it from a TED talk, but the reality is I did. I watched a TED talk by a guy named Astro Teller. He runs X, which is Google's moonshot factory. And he talks about the phrase that he uses in that talk I love. It's called enthusiastic skepticism. Enthusiastic skepticism is kind of how I live my life and run my business and how I've built this platform. And it speaks directly to continuous improvement, right? Basically, it means that even if you're good at something and even if you're wildly successful, you are enthusiastic about finding a way to do it even better. Right? You're skeptical that you're at the top of the game. There's always a level up that you can go. You can always get a little bit better. And so you're enthusiastic about doing that. And that for me, that comes from continuous improvement. And one of the ways that I continuously improve the work that I do today is I collaborate regularly. I do a lot of co-teaching. The photo that's on the screen here in front of you is from the last class I taught in person. It was in Paris. It was in March of uh, 13th, 2020. And it was with Jeff Patton. Now, Jeff Patton and I teach together for many reasons. One of them is I learn from him. I get better at my craft. I get better at telling stories. I see how he tells his stories. And even though we're, we're teaching the same stuff, we come at it from two different directions. And so I always get better by collaborating with co-facilitators. And I do that all the time today still to make my practice better. Now, the last quality that really helps me, helped me build the platform and, and helps me can make it continuously relevant is reinvention. What got you here won't get you there, right? The, the ideas that, that, that got you to this point are not going to be that relevant necessarily, or at least the way that you're applying them in a continuously changing world, a high pace of change, technologically driven world, right? And so then how do you take the things that you're good at, the things that you've done, and then reinvent them for current realities on the ground? One of the things that I'm doing, for example, I, I talk a lot about design thinking, product thinking, business agility, lean UX, lean startup, those types of things. Overwhelmingly over the years, I've spoken primarily to product development teams, tech organizations. But the reality is that there are other disciplines within each organization that would benefit from these ideas and rarely get exposed to them. HR, legal, finance, compliance, et cetera, get tremendous value from the ideas behind design thinking, product thinking, lean startup, lean UX, agile, et cetera. One of the things that I'm continuously doing is taking those ideas to those disciplines, specifically in this case, HR, and showing them how that can really improve the way that they do their work. In fact, I wrote about it in HBR and Harvard Business Review not too long ago, just a few months ago to talk about that. And by continuously reinventing myself, I'm growing my network, I'm growing my audience, and I'm increasing the diversity of opportunities that I'm driving towards me. So those are the five qualities that I've discovered in myself to becoming forever employable and increasing the agility of my career. Now to get to, to building this platform, I've taken five very specific steps. I'm gonna share those steps with you now. And they are these five steps, plant a flag, tell your story, follow the new path, teach and give it all away. Let's go through each one of these and I'll give you examples of what I did and what each one of these means. So let's go with the first one. Planting a flag is deciding what's gonna be the core 
content that you're going to base your platform on? What are you going to be known for? Right? What is the slice of your discipline or your domain that you're going to own? That's what planting a flag means. And it's an exercise between going too broad and going too thin, right? So you can go really broad and say agile, right? And that's way too broad, right? What, what, what about agile, right? You can go way too narrow and say uh, agile for veterinary practices in Spanish, right? Way too narrow, right? <laughs> My guess is there's not a massive audience for that. You've got to find the balance somewhere in the middle here, right? That says something effective, right? I'm going to own agile coaching for healthcare uh, companies, right? In the United States, something like that, right? That's where you have to kind of find the balance. That's where you plant your flag. And that's what you're going to be known for. Now, the people who have done this well, be, have become synonymous with the flag that they've planted. So for example, I'll put some names up, right? Uh, Eric Reese, for example, we know exactly what his flag was. It was lean startup. And, and for the most part, continues to this day. Jake Knapp planted his flag on design sprints, right? He's the design sprint guy. Um, Alex Osterwalder in Switzerland planted his flag with business model generation, the business model canvas, and this goes on and on. People, Seth Godin, right? He's the, um, he's the marketing guru, right? That's where he planted his flag. There is an American comedian named Sarah Cooper. Um, she planted her flag as basically a Trump lip sync impersonator. Everybody in the US knows her as that, right? And my flag was Lean UX. That's where I started. I started by working on the intersection of Agile and user experience, because that's the work that I was doing. There was a tremendous amount of demand for that. And I was qualified to talk about it. So it wasn't UX and it wasn't agile and it wasn't lean or lean startup. It was just enough of, of a, a differentiation to say agile and UX together. And we're going to call it lean UX. Now, you may say, well, Jeff, how do I figure out where to plant my flag? And there's, there's a lot of ways that I talk about in the book to do that. But one of the things I've learned since publishing the book is that there's this fantastic uh, Japanese concept of Ikigai. And this is a great exercise to run through as you're thinking about where to plant your flag. Now, Ikigai means your reason for being. It's the reason why you get up in the morning. And the, the interpretation of it is that there are four questions that you need to answer. Well, what do you love? What are you good at? What does the world need? And what can you get paid for? And you can answer those questions individually, but the goal is to find answers that actually tick all four boxes. If you can find something that you love, something that you're good at, something that the world needs, and you can get paid for it, that's a great flag to plant. Now you may come up with multiple flags to plant, multiple ideas, and that's perfectly okay because you can test and learn and experiment your way to figure out which one has the most viable audience how to tell your story in those particular, uh, to those particular audiences or about that particular content. But the idea is to generate at least one or two things that fall right there in the middle because those could qualify well as your flag. And to be, and to be very frank, this might be professional or it might be personal, right? Maybe there's some personal projects and personal passions that you have that may fall here and that may be where you wanna plant your flag. So that's step one, planting your flag. Step two is telling your story. Your idea is to become a storyteller and to become excellent at explaining what you've planted your flag about, right? What is your expertise and your experience? And you're going to take every opportunity to do that. Now, this is where most people get stuck because we, they get stuck in their own heads and they let doubt take over, right? What unique story do I have? Everyone has good experience. She has more to offer than I do. My story isn't extraordinary enough to be unique. But here's the thing. The best part of your experience and of your story is not how massively successful you've been, whether you've run an ultra marathon or you work with celebrities. The best part of your experience is that nobody else has it. Right? You can tell a story that nobody else can. You're the only person to have gone through everything you have in the ways and at the times that you have, and only you have that perspective. And that's a great place to start. Start with what you've done and what you know, and you can expand from there. And that's what I did. And I started telling my story about Agile and UX 
on August 12, 2010, when I gave the first talk, public talk, about the work that we were doing at the Ladders about integrating UX and Agile. Now, the date is important because this is two and a half years after my 35th birthday. Okay, this stuff takes time. You've got to take the time to build up the the audience, the network, the body of work, the content before you kind of head out there. And for me, it took two and a half years to give my first talk. A month later in Paris, I gave the first talk where I ever said the words Lean UX on stage. And really it took three years after my 35th birthday, so I'm now 38, to really get my big break. On March 7th, 2011, Smashing Magazine an online design magazine published this article. It's called Lean UX Getting Out of the Deliverables Business. Now, this was important because in 2011, Smashing had a million readers in their audience. So all of a sudden, the conversations that I was having, whether it was on, on small blog posts or at conferences, now went global. Right? Everybody is now reading this, and we're now starting to discuss this conversation on a global scale. So there's lots of inbound discussion about this because Smashing has that kind of reach. And now I've got tons more opportunities to tell my story. I'm giving talks. All my talks at that point are about Lean UX. And literally every single channel that I could find, I was experimenting with to understand how to best reach my audience. Right? I was tweeting, I was publishing on Medium, on Quora, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. I was building an email list and testing and learning my way to understand where my audience lived, how they like to get content, how they like to read it, and what they were getting out of it. Honestly, the only channel that we stopped short of using was Lean UX, the musical. We thought about writing it and producing it, decided that this was a bad idea. Now look, in hindsight, trying to understand why that story resonated, why it helped me build that platform and the business that I have today where opportunities are coming in, right? Well, number one, I solved a real problem that many people had. So as you think about what to share out there, think about the problems that you're solving that other people have. I had actual real world experience solving that problem. It wasn't theoretical, it wasn't academic, it wasn't hypothetical, I was doing the work. And so I could share that work be specific. We did this. We did this other thing. And I shared those uh, that work humbly. I shared the stuff that worked really well. And I shared the stuff that failed miserably. And that really helps to build that connection with your audience to say, look, we weren't perfect, but we tried this. This is what worked. This is what didn't work. This is what we learned from that. And here's what you can do, right? Very practical, very tactical advice. And that's what builds that authentic connection with your target audience. Now, so we've planted our flag and now we're telling our story, starting to build that network, starting to build that audience, starting to get our message out there. And it starts to work. Step three is to follow the new path. As you amplify your message, as you begin to be, as you become a better storyteller, new paths, new opportunities begin to emerge, right? You start to attract work towards you. And this is what was happening to me with Lean UX. People were asking me to, to, to give talks and, and I was doing less and less actual design work. And if you recall back to the beginning of the story, I was already fairly terrified that my design skills weren't keeping pace with what new designers were capable of doing. And now I'm doing less and less design work because what I'm actually doing is flying around the world and talking and teaching and speaking about Lean UX. It turns out though, that the more that you do that, new opportunities come your way. And it turns out that book publishers go to conferences. And at those conferences, they look for speakers who are talking about the latest topics and are talking about it in a knowledgeable way and they offer them book deals. I got offered a book deal at a conference to write the Lean UX book. This was a brand new opportunity. I'd never really thought it would come my way, but it was a new path and I decided to go down this path. Right? because that's why I was building this platform for these new opportunities to present themselves. And so I decided to jump into it and write the Lean UX book, except I didn't tell the publisher one very, very important thing. What I didn't tell the publisher was that I didn't know how to write a book. I had no idea how to do it, right? 500 words I could do, 750 words I could do, 50,000 words. <laughs> it's like Mount Everest. I'm never going to climb that mountain. But it's a new opportunity. And I jumped into it. And really, as you think about it, right, people say, well, Jeff, you're very lucky, right, to have that opportunity. Absolutely. 
hundred percent. Very lucky, very privileged to have that opportunity come my way. However, I love this particular quote, right? Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. The opportunity came my way. I was ready to take it because I was doing this explicitly. I was building this platform, right? This magnet for opportunities so that when these opportunities came in, I was ready to jump on them to follow these new paths. And that's what I did. As it turns out, writing that book certainly was much more brutal than I anticipated. It took me two years to get Lean UX done. I burned through three editors. I wrote the manuscript four times, start to finish before the publisher agreed to publish it. And then finally, 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 March 11th, 2013, Lean UX comes out. Now, again, the date's important. I'm 40 years old now. I'm old, right? It took me five years to get here from the morning of my 35th birthday of waking up in that cold sweat to my first book being published. It took five years to get there. A ton of hard work, a ton of experimentation, a ton of continuous learning and improvement to figure out how to craft a message that lots of people will want to hear and that can get translated into various mediums that then attract opportunities to me. So you've planted your flag, you've told your story, you're following the new path. Step number four is teaching. If you would have asked me 15 years ago, Jeff, what are you going to be doing in 15 years? I would never have said teaching. And yet everything I do today is teaching. What I'm doing right now with you is teaching workshops, conferences, webinars, podcasts, blogging, guest articles, and interviews. I say yes to almost everything because to me, this is an opportunity for me to teach my expertise. And when you can teach something well, you get better at the craft itself. You get feedback on your material. You learn how to improve your storytelling. You understand where your story is resonating and where it could use updating and where there are content opportunities for you to, to share more or what people need to, to hear more of. And this is what I do all the time and I get better at it. Now, look, I'm self-employed and this is basically my business up here on a slide. This is what I do for a living. If you work as an in-house employee, you can do the same thing. You have tremendous opportunities in-house to teach, to share your knowledge, to share your expertise and to build that kind of platform, even as an in-house employee, so that new opportunities come to you both from inside that organization, as well as outside the organization, from, from conferences, from events, and from other employers as well. And these are just a, a short list of things that you can do in-house to help to, to tell your story, okay? So, uh, we and to teach, right? So we, we've planted our flag, you're telling your story, you're following these new paths, you're teaching. The fifth and final step is to give it all away. This is the most unintuitive part of this whole journey for me. It's the thing that took me the longest to learn. And I learned it kind of most recently because look, I've been working professionally for over 20 years. I have experience, I have expertise, and I expect to get paid for that experience and that expertise. And I expect that you should get paid for your experience and your expertise. And yet, the more you give away, the more you give back to your communities, the more you give back to the discipline, the more that you share freely online, the more opportunities come back to you. It's unintuitive, but it works. And to achieve that, you need to make your work and yourself easily findable and accessible. Post all of your materials, anything that you create, articles, webinars, podcasts, blog posts, whatever it is, on easily findable sites. If you're just starting out, Post them on LinkedIn, post it on Medium, post it anywhere that you can get traffic to that so that people start to associate your flag with your name. The challenge with those uh, social media sites is that you're renting that audience. You don't actually own that audience. Ultimately, you want to bring everything that you're doing underneath your own name and underneath your own brand. Today, everything that I do is findable at my website at jeffguyhealth.com. It's all there and almost all of it is free. The blog posts, the resources, the videos to, of keynotes, um, links to podcasts, everything's free, right? Except the classes that I sell and the books that I sell but it's all there. And amazingly, people will come and watch a video that's on my website and then hire me to give that talk, right? So give it all away. Give back to your community locally. Start a meetup, support a meetup, help a local conference get off the ground. If you have friends in local organizations, ask to give a talk there for free. Practice your teaching, practice your presentation skills, tell that story, build goodwill, build that community. Eventually that comes back to you as well. Now, to wrap this up, a few things to remember here. Now, 
To be successful, to be forever employable, to build a platform of thought leadership and expertise that drives opportunities towards you, you have to stay relevant. In order to stay relevant, you have to stay active, active in the conversations around your work, have a presence online, have a presence in the community, do the work, contribute to the canon, participate, etc. It's a hustle. It's a lot of work. And if you've got a full-time job and you've got a family, et cetera, you got to fit it in in the cracks. I get it. It's hard work. If you're looking to reinvent yourself from one thing to the next, like, I, like I'm doing with uh, bringing product thinking to HR and legal and finance, give yourself time to transition into these new domains, right? I've found that at least two years is what I need to truly establish credibility in a new domain before opportunities start to come to me. HR, for example, 20 months ago, I really had no credentials speaking to HR people about anything. But over the last 20 months, I've injected myself into the conversations. I've offered up some content. I've commented on some things online. I've participated in some events to the point now where I'm starting to have real conversations about agile HR and product thinking in HR. But it took 18 to 20 months to get here. The story I'm sharing with you today is just one path. This is my path. Right? So it's based on, on my situation, my privileges, the opportunities that I had given to me. There are many other options. Pick and choose the ideas that work for you and put them into action to start to build that platform and to drive yourself towards becoming forever employable. And then lastly, I will share with you this Bezos quote because I really want you to consider how you're thinking about your career from this same lens. Right? Bezos says that everybody asks him, what's gonna change in the next five years? And he says, look, I don't think about my business that way. I think about my business, about what's not going to change over the next 10 to 20 years. And that's far more important. What are people always going to need in the workplace, in whatever sector that you're servicing? And focus on that, how you deliver that, the job titles, the skill sets, the technology, all of that is going to change. But the core problem that you're solving is going to stay consistent for the next 10 to 20 years Focus on that, and that is what's going to help you become forever employable. Thanks so much for listening.